right, welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our final artist talk in our series um, from the 2022 New Jersey Arts Annual Reemergence Exhibition. Today we're joined by Mark Ludick and Caroline Burden, uh, two artists in our exhibition. This is a really wonderful series that we've had since September um, last year where our public gets an opportunity to interact with the artists in the exhibition and get to learn more about their practice and, and their works. Um, so yeah, both in the galleries and also online, on Instagram Live and on our YouTube channel. Um, yeah, we're one, really lucky to be joined by these two artists here for our grand finale. Um, before we start, I want to mention that the 2022 New Jersey Arts Annual Reemergence is a project of the New Jersey State Council on the Arts and the New Jersey State Museum. Funding for the New Jersey Arts Annual Reemergence has been made possible in part by funds from the New Jersey State Council on the Arts and has received additional support from the New Jersey State Museum Foundation through the Lucille M. Paris Fund. I don't know, I haven't memorize that by now. <laughs> I've said it so many times. Um, but yeah, like I said, we're, we're privileged to be joined here by these artists. I'll give a very brief introduction now. I won't speak too much about them because they'll be speaking about themselves and their work very shortly. Um, but Mark Ludek is a, an artist and photographer based in Lambertville, New Jersey. His work in documentary, editorial, and fine art photography explores international and domestic issues related to human rights, public health, and the environment. Mark has been on faculty at Monmouth University since 2006. He received his MFA from Hunter College and has exhibited his works um, across many venues on the East Coast. Uh, Caroline Burden is a Jersey City-based artist. Her practice and work on canvas uh, and in sculpture is process-driven and finds inspiration in architectural forms, land formations, and the ways in which chance operates in both art and life. Caroline received her MFA from uh, Mason Gross School of the Arts at Rutgers and has exhibited widely in group and solo exhibitions across the country. So please join me in uh, welcoming these two artists for this wonderful talk we're about to have in our galleries. Um, I believe Mark has volunteered to go first, so we will join him right over there. Luckily, our artists are in the same gallery, so we don't have a lot of, uh, there won't be a lot of traveling in between them. So I'll hand things off. Thank you all for being here, and thank you, Sarah, for this wonderful exhibition. And um, it's certainly a pleasure to, to be in this museum. Um, I pass it almost a lot, every day almost sometimes, and I've always wanted to have work in this museum, just because it's the New Jersey State Museum and it's around. So um, it's really a pleasure to be here, an honor, and I'm delighted to see so much outrageously fabulous work here. Um, the subject matter for this was this pandemic and lockdown which I think I felt um, in so many ways, right? Um, so many ways, um, both isolated and then um, in many cases, some of the things that I was covering and photographing at the time due to its mm, coincidental, coincidentally, this was also a time of a lot of social um, mm, upheaval around the George Floyd protests. So I was out for much of the time also in crowds. So it alternated between being in a crowd with people that were potentially, um, one thought, you're, you're, you're going to get COVID, and it wasn't like COVID like we think of COVID now. It was sort of COVID where we really don't know what it's about and what the long-term implications of it would be. So everyone that was out on the streets and um, putting themselves on the line during that time. It was a real privilege to work with those people and photograph them. This on Columbus, the shrouded statue of Columbus, which was really taken right here in Trenton, um, was from that period. And, um, yeah. 
was from that period. I began to photograph statues, right? Like I couldn't help but notice next door, on the other side of this wall is a collection of civil um, war flags. And this group of work, this series of work really began in Charlottesville, Virginia, where I was down photographing the removal, what I thought would be the removal of a, sta of a Robert E. Lee statue that turned into really a, um, a riot and of, of white supremacists. And I began photographing that more and more and more over the next few years. Um, beginning really with Dylan Roof's assassination of nine um, church growers in um, um, Charleston. And um, then in Indiana. And then, um, you know, so this sort of came out of that work. Um, the fact that it was shrouded, right? And there was also one, and there was also a shrouded one uh, not with uh, cloth. This one was sort of really kind of nicely done, like a mummy, really. The one in Philadelphia is boxed in in, pla in plywood. So I was interested in the way that two things. One, the way that we respond to these things, but also in all of the work, this as well, and in all of the work that I do, I'm really interested in the way that the manufactured world that we live in, the human-built environment that we exist in, is in many ways a mirror of our, of our psyche, culturally. So that's interesting to me, and it's something that I, I try to explore. So within this sort of mm, vacuum of the pandemic lockdown, um, it gave things sort of really um, dilated, time dilated in a real way. And it also gave us the opportunity, gave me the opportunity to explore um, things in a more intimate way. Yeah. Um, so that's this, and I was surprised. I read about it, or read about it in the paper, that there was a statue in Trenton that was going to be um, considered removal. And um, so I went and photographed it, and. Um, not, it's a beautiful park. Um, not really much more I can say about it. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my process. Technically my process. My background is in documentary work and um, mm, traditions which I feel most akin to are the Works Progress Administration out of the 30s and the Photo League out of New York. Uh, during the 40s and 50s. That's the work that I'm very much familiar with and I consider very close to my heart. Um, my process is really very straightforward. Um, really, I go to a place, look, wait, if the light isn't right, I come back. On these types of images, um, part of the reason I work at these images are taken at night is another thing which we'll talk about, but I'm interested in the sort of uniformity of the, the space. If there was harsh shadows here, it wouldn't really work in my opinion. We'd be tending to look at that. So, I go to, a, to this location, set up my camera, photograph, go back, review it in um, the software that I work with. Um, it's a very straightforward process, very little manipulation, as little as possible, no addition or no subtraction, really. Um, and then print. So all total, it's um, probably a period of days between when I photograph and when this comes out. Sometimes it happens that I don't see the image for a long time. It can be months, six months, a year in some, time, some cases. Where all of a sudden you are looking through your work or you're looking through hundreds of images and all of a sudden one registers and you all of a sudden see it. It doesn't mean that I didn't see it before, it just means that at this particular time it, it really resonates. So that, that, that's what happened with this image and there was a 
series of uh, related images, but this is the one. It's very straightforward, um, very sort of um, staged uh, in a sort of theatrical way. Um, single vanishing point, very straightforward image, yeah. Um, in black and white. I work in black and white on many documentary projects because color, as we see the world around us in color and we don't respond to the world in color, or, you know, I do, um, has a psychological effect that black and white doesn't. And in some ways black and white is more abstract. It's, one is able to get to the content of what's there um, faster and without the sort of emotional import that color can place upon the image. Oftentimes, and it's, and it's also easier when working with image, which is, images which are really related to, got really quiet. Yeah, yeah. that the children yeah. have. Yeah. <laughs> um, I find when I work in color that it's very, that you, you're waiting and you're looking and you're waiting and you're looking for content and form to coalesce. In many times with documentary work, there is simply not time for that to happen. So I tend to like, and probably my preference is to work in black and white, but I love color as well. I love to print color. I love to photograph in black and white. That's, they're two almost different things. The phys I love the physicality of color, and I like the concept of black and white. So it's a sort of, so I work in both, but you know, that's kind of... Um, what else can I say about the work? Um, this work comes out of exploring places that are of, mm, in, in a status of change. And these sort of liminal spaces, really, spaces between one step and another, right? These sorts of liminal spaces, um, I'm intrigued by. And this is a shopping mall, um, the, the um, Mammoth, uh, like the Eatontown shopping mall, not far from where I, I teach, and um, vacant, which in a time as, at least in, um, which reflects our changes in shopping habits, um, the changes in the way that we really work and, and consume both um, objects and images. Um, and I've been photographing these and distribution centers because if you travel in New Jersey and you look around the landscape, you're going to see massive distribution centers. And I think that also reflects a change in our landscape, but also a change in our psyche as well. We're so happy to be surrounded by um, buildings which are exactly the same. If you look at all of the entry doors to the warehouses that go in, they're, they're, everyone is exactly the same, they're the same size. The way that everything is being sort of hmm, put into a, um, a form that's the same and replicated throughout the state, throughout as I travel around the United States as well, we're not the only place that has distribution centers. Right? So that's been occupying part of that time as well, and it's related to this work, which was for a long time I was photographing abandoned shopping malls along Highway 130, which travels, which was a major sort of thoroughfare in New Jersey. And this kind of grew out of that work, I mean, as a continuation of it, really. I photographed them at night because I don't want us to be attracted to anything other than what is the space or the light and the emptiness that's there. So it creates real problems printing because it's, as anyone who has used a printer, a large wide format printer, it's really hard to get a black and it's really hard to get a consistent black. And then on top of that, it's really hard to get it where you don't have an error in the ink. Uh, in, the, in the way that the ink sprays. So these are really, it's a really challenging series of work, but it sort of gets it to its very minimalistic approach to the image. And I'm, I'm kind of interested in the fact that 
as I look at these images, or as I look at this image as well, is it's kind of hard to tell what it is. And you really have to do, you really have to really go into that darkness really to kind of see what it is. And then you'll start to see sort of signs and little things that tell you where you're at. So that's this group of work. Um, and to be honest with you, I think probably on some levels there isn't the same sort of emotional connection to the work, to this work, as to this work. I'm not certain exactly why, but I find that the work that came out of the George Floyd and the real, um, uh, really socially, more socially oriented work um, engages me in another way. So it's quite a different way of working, and I think um, as someone who was trained in the, in the studio arts and then moved into photography, um, it was largely the movement into photography was for its social um, component, really, to get out of my studio where I was painting and drawing and into the world. Um, that's about all right. I'm going to ask if anyone has any questions, and then that could be. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, I'll start with a question. Sure. I guess I'm just curious if, so the, you said that this work on the bottom is related, it's sort of related to a work that you do on Drawn My Way 130, you said? And 195. On 195? Yeah. Um, is that, the start of that series, does that precede the pandemic? It does. Okay, yeah. oh yeah. that's interesting. Yeah. Um, but this one was during the pandemic. Yeah, just a little bit before. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, but at the same time, yeah. Interesting. Did that series kind of did it evolve at all during the pandemic, or like your thinking around it, um, sort of the isolation of these? Uh, it areas? became more pronounced. Yeah. And I started to look at it. More. It was interesting, and still is interesting. The shift that occurred, at least for me, photographing, and we're often photographing in crowds. That usually I'm really attracted to people and not and have no fear, but during the pandemic, every other human being became a potential source for one's illness, which was a real different way to look at the world, actually. So that was so one sort of informed the other, and it was and and so this would be a even though th this would be like a rest place. Do you, do you know, you, you don't have to worry about people, you can just be in the space. There's no one else there, right? Whereas when you're in a crowd, it, you know, you're, on a, you're basically a raw nerve. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, that's interesting to hear sort of how, yeah, you're thinking around these sort of different, like, documentary photography mm -hmm. or otherwise sort of shifted during that time. Has it shifted again since, since then? I'm still there. Uh -huh. I'm still there, really. I mean, I love these spaces, and um, I have to say that um, other things have occurred um, where I'm still interested in spaces, the public spaces primarily, which we inhabit or don't inhabit. Okay? We don't inhabit public spaces so much anymore. Yeah. Um, so that's an int that's that's of interest to me at this point. Um, and I think just the awareness of mm, the potential of our interrelationship as humans, because of that. If I have, you know, here we're in a. For the longest, I thought this would be on Zoom. Do you know? Uh huh. Right. So yeah. do, do do you know? So just the fact that we're here in person with one another is a real commitment to our shared humanity and to our shared. For life. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, this series of talks is sort of one of the first public programs that we've done since the pandemic, and so it's you know its own. Yeah, you know, the show is called Reemergence, and this is sort of another example of that kind of trial, seeing how this goes, if people will come, if people are willing to share the space. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, the same. Yeah, this could have been on Zoom easily. Too. Yeah, right, right. But, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I guess um, the other part too, I guess for me, it is that it's um, 
it's very much, this is very much of this time. One couldn't, I couldn't have made these images at any, I wouldn't have thought to make these images at another time. The, for this image, the social factors weren't in play at that point. There was no concept really of, um, mm, what would we call it with the Columbus statue, the Christopher Columbus statues all over the place. Another area where I've been photographing have been the internment and concentration camps in the United States. These places are also the same, where we've really, um, th there's just a building and growing awareness of what these places are that we um, have been a part of our history for so long, um, but now we view them very differently. And. Um, so it's kind of a very curious time, actually. Yeah, there, and I think that's interesting. I'll let other people ask questions and comment, too. Mm -hmm. But, um, I, you know, these, these photos are very much of the moment. There's also something, I mean, if, if, and I think this is something that black and white brings to it. Um, you know, a, Timeless, I don't know if that's the word, but it, it could be an image that would stick out if it were in a group of images from the past, from you know the photo week or something like that. But um, you know, you could find it there, but then you would ask questions like, why are these things covered right. up? And that the only way to explain that is because it's from the present moment. But you, it, it's right. you know, there's something very paparazzi even about this the light right. coming through or you know, some other photo week images that I can think of right now. But the but they do stick out because all of a sudden you realize that there's a modern connection. Well, huge influence. You know, Edward Hopper, a huge influence. Yeah. On, 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 Interesting. And, and it's interesting. You know, the other part is because you brought up the Photo League. At the time of the Photo League, a Christopher Columbus statue would have been heralded. Right. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. And so that shift really is, is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, has the, has the, the statue been removed? No, I haven't been back to it. I drove by and, and yeah. um, to see. It, it was shrouded at the time, now, but it probably has been. Interesting. Yeah. I know the one in Philadelphia, they had a big battle over. Yes, I don't even know how that ended up actually. But yeah, it's interesting where the shrouding or the, the covering up of the statue is like kind of protection for it, but also like. We're going to take this down, but we're also going to protect it or shroud it. Shrouding is also its own symbolic death kind of imagery. One um, never knows where this is going to... One of the places that I've been photographing was Thule Lake up in Northern California, which was the largest internment center touring of Japanese Americans. Mm -hmm. It was like the, the really hard the penal institution, prison for and. Uh, there is nothing left there. Wow. Zero. They absolutely eliminated everything. Wow. No remembrance at all. And um, it'll be curious to see how we revisit that. Like, we can't just erase our mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? There is, there should be some sort of reminder as well. So it brings up a lot of that. And um, this shopping mall will be redeveloped. The whole mall was, was purchased. Oh, wow. Yeah, it'll be um, a, 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 a series of neighborhoods. Oh, like completely different. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Really interesting. Yeah. Um, does anybody else have a... Please. If I well, if I don't alter them? Yeah. Yeah. On this one, the exposure is really it's way underexposed. Oh, okay. Because in order to hold highlight back in order to not blow out these highlights, right. you need one needs to underexpose anyway. Do you know? So this is probably on, in comparison, it would probably be according to the meter, it would be probably four stops underexposed. Um, and so that's part of it. The other part is just adding contrast to the image. You know, you're, you're adding some contrast. Thank you, Mark. That's awesome. Um, I just have a comment about the, the darker photograph of the mall at night. And you remarked that perhaps that one was less, maybe less emotional and feeling than the top one in that pop series. Well, for me. For yeah. me, I mean, I think the 
talk about is very emotional. I love the kind of abstract qualities actually of both of them. But I feel the bottom one has an intense amount of emotion. It, it, it sort of evokes a kind of loneliness and and loss. Um, and and when you, I mean, basically the image that you took is also documenting, um, you know, a, a structure that will no longer exist, right? And so I um, I think that one also has a lot of emotion. Yeah. For what it's worth. Sure. Hey, thank you. Yeah. And and also, you know. The places that we inhabit, these places were also places for social interaction. And um, one of the fears that that I have without, when we do go over to a fully model of really automated sort of deliverable, we, we don't shop collectively, we don't go to the market anymore, um, is that we'll lose that social interaction, we'll lose that sort of serendipity that can occur um, when, when people are together, you know, that, that we really can't plan on. So that, yeah, so there's the loss there too. It's sort of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so many things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm an artist, but I'm not a photographer, so I'm just curious when you said you like to photograph in black and white and print in color. When you go into, let's say, the top area or something like that, in your head, do you kind of visualize it in black and white? Like when mm -hmm. you're looking at it, how it will print out in black and white? You yes. See it? Yes, um, absolutely. Um, like, this is my favorite day for black and white photography. Overca heavy overcast, middle of the day. It's very bright, but yeah. But we, but we were able to get detail in the sky very easily. Um, so that, that's it. Um, yeah, I was specifically looking for days like that when working in black and white. Yeah, us, and um, due to the way that we we work with color channels in black and white, like color, um, black and white is a subtractive color process, whereas a color image is additive, right? So to make this area darker with these green trees, I, I would actually take green out. Mm -hmm. Right, and it gets darker. So it's a sort of backwards way of thinking about things. So in one's mind, you're, you've made that switch. And it's interesting, so much of, because um, I work with students, so much of working with students is getting them to make that switch, to make the switch from seeing, to being able to visualize it in their head before they make the photograph. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Yeah. I think yeah. that's a great place to, to end and um, yeah thank you yeah hey thank you uh So uh, this is my piece, and I'm going to start by just giving you a little bit of my background, where I grew up, um, and as well, including like my parents, because these factors have, have kind of helped form the language behind my work. So I grew up in Ohio, for the most part, which is flat farmland, uh, and I also spent a lot of time um, as a child in the mountains of Colorado, which is kind of the opposite, it's, it's a, a vertical sort of space, and we had a little cabin in the, high in the mountains, um, and you felt like you were enveloped by the sky on this. And then after I went to undergraduate school in Cleveland, I moved to New York, where I was living among the skyscrapers and buildings. And so, all of those different land forms and formations and building formations um, have informed my work. And then there's my parents. So my parents, uh, my father was an engineer and led a very, um, everything for him was about structure and having a plan and was very compartmentalized. Um, and there was a very strong kind of work ethic, the Protestant work ethic, which I inherited. And then my mother, 
uh, was was really the complete opposite of my father. She was um, very liberal, a social worker, um, a feminist in a very small town where she may have been one of the very few true feminists at the time. And um, and she was really she kind of as she even as she got older, my parents eventually divorced, and she kind of had a messy life. If you want to put it like that, but that was like the imperfect life. And, and the sort of juxtaposition of my father's desire for perfection and my mother's desire for imperfection um, kind of coalesce uh, to inform my process and the way I work. Uh, and then there, there was another um, person in my life, several, many people, but um, a man who was not my real uncle, he was Uncle Henry, and he was a colleague of my father's, an engineer, he was German, and from the time I was a tiny little girl, he would lecture me about the Bauhaus <laughs> and minimalism and the importance of these things. And it's actually only recently that I've sort of drawn that connection. You know, sometimes in, in life and as an artist, you, you go through the process of making and working, and over time, you look at your past and you find connections that maybe you, um, you just realize at the time. So that, that's kind of like broad stroke influences. Oh, and I, I almost, as a result of my father and Uncle Henry, I came very close to studying architecture, which is still a love of mine. Um, but I didn't study architecture. I studied design and, and painting and fine arts. Um, and uh, so now I'm gonna segue to my process. And the way I work, I'm, I'm a sculptor, painter, printmaker, um, and this work involves printing and painting. Uh, the series is called the Incarnation Series, uh, and the reason it's titled that, and there are many within this series, is because um, as, as I'm making this work, it, it kind of appears. It kind of Sometimes I look at it when it's finished and I'm not quite sure how it even happened. It's like it, it um, is, is an incarnation. Um, and, and I'm the vessel or the vehicle by which it comes to be. So the way I work is I, first of all, I, I, I do research sometimes. As I said, I'm, I'm very much influenced by architecture, buildings, land formations. I do little, tiny little sketches in my sketchbook, lots of them, and I research and I write, and then I arrive at one or two or three um, that, I, that I would like to start on in terms of making them much larger, as in the piece here. And uh, I work on the floor. Ideally, I like to work on maybe three or four pieces at a time, which requires more studio space than I currently have. So a lot of times I, I'll begin these works at an artist residency where, where I may have like a large space, also not full of my own artwork so that I can spread out and work on the floor. So I, again, I kind of arrive at sort of rough compositions through the sketch process. And um, then I put the canvas on the floor, I figure out the size, and I, I'll do a couple layers of underpainting. These are mostly acrylic, um, acrylic paint. And then I spend hours and days mixing paint and doing testing of various colors and hues um, in order to kind of be begin the process. And then the, the next thing I do is I use crocheted handmade afghans um, as printing tools to make the works. So, and I collect these in thrift stores. Um, I have, I don't know how many in my studio, piles and piles of them. Um, and this, this started as an experiment, literally, when I was at a residency, just searching for um, a way to maybe incorporate printmaking, which is something I also studied and is part of my background. Um, I was looking for a way to maybe incorporate printmaking into my work. And so, again, it started as an experiment and has developed over um, 
the past five, six, seven years. So I, I applied paint to the Afghan, and then I literally, I worked on the floor on top of the pieces and pressed the paint from the Afghan onto the surface, if that makes sense. And I work in sections, um, and there are times when I'll take off sections and kind of work that way. So in a way, these pieces get built much the way like a building or a structural form gets built. I start, I have the idea, and then it kind of continues and evolves. And as I said, I'm often uh, kind of even a little surprised at the end. Uh, and so hopefully the piece works out and I don't end up painting over it and starting over again, which also happens. Um, I think, you know, the thing about working with Afghans, and I've given a lot of thought to this, Afghans, if you know what I'm talking about, and I probably could have brought one today, but um, they're, they're crocheted, they're sort of not in vogue and not in style right now, which is why I can find them in thrift stores and the Salvation Army for a few dollars. Um, they're brightly colored, usually. And, you know, as I've worked with them, I've thought a lot about who made them, where they came from, were they gifts, or was it a gift for like a child, a loved one, a family, a friend. Um, and then, you know, they're works of art. They're all, kind of, you, you sense the hand in them, and how did they land in a thrift store? And, you know, as, as calm as a discarded object. So, I have a lot of respect for these Afghans. Um, as you can imagine, and if you think about it, they all are, are um, kind of woven of different patterns, um, which is another thing that I experiment with and kind of discover along the way with each one that I work with. Um, and, and back to the people that make them, I, you know, I kind of feel like the hand that made the Afghan is connected to my, my own hand and the way I make and work. Um, and, and this is, I think, the point where I can touch on just the fact that I think in this day and age, I feel like, you know, yes, we are here today. Um, and connections are something that are, I think, vital to our, uh, our existence in a way. You know, not only did we experience the pandemic and are we not together as much, but we're also on our phones all the time. We're calling each other less. We're um, texting and emailing and sort of, maybe there's a little bit of a loss of human connection. Um, and so I, I think about this as a, um, you know, I didn't even ask you, Sarah, why you selected this particular piece mm. for the exhibition, but um, as I think about re-emergence and finding and discovering those connections, it feels kind of apropos to me. And then, then, in this particular piece as well, um, there's yellow, a lot of sort of this yellow gold color, which mark, I find, a relationship between yeah. your, your, your darker piece with the gold coming through. Um, so I really like that we have that sort of um, connection there. Um, but that, that sort of bright color is really bright for me. Like this particular piece has a lot of color and brightness. And I feel like that is maybe the optimism for the way we all move forward and emerge from, re-emerge from the pandemic um, and, you know, probably any, anything that we've been facing in our lives. And I don't know if I have much more to say. I guess, you know, it's pretty obvious, maybe, well, to me it is, but the grid, um, is it permeates pretty much all of my work and I often talk about the grid as the kind of structure that holds the work together um, and then the kind of imperfections that happen with you know the way like this isn't a straight line it kind of is wonky and then continues down and has you know I, I really try to leave the imperfections and not not go back in and touch things up, but really just leave them. 
as, as like I think you brought up humanity too, Mark, and um, I'm very, uh, I think there's, I'd like to think there's a lot of humanity um, within this work, even though it is abstract. Yeah, thanks, Caroline. Yeah, it's interesting. To, and that makes a lot of sense to me. The Bauhaus school, you know, has these separate parts, but they're all like, interconnected. The architecture, design, craft, uh, and then sort of more fine art areas are all together. And your your work does bring those things together um, in its own way. So that's that's really interesting to think about it through through that lens, kind of having that thought. I don't know, just sort of in your brain. In a way, you're bridging uh, Joseph and Annie Alpas mm. uh, together. I love that. <laughs> 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 I love that, yes. The too, corner um, of his painting was, you know, pattern coming from textile mm. and weaving. So really, I didn't know that part okay. after. That's so good. I love that. I, I mean, I really enjoy when when I get feedback like that. When someone sees something that maybe I haven't yet seen, um, I'm, I'm really interested in that. So thank you for that. Are you using the same afghan in this uh, in this work for, for each of these? Areas? Yes, that's a great question. There's one afghan. I almost always use. I choose one afghan and then I kind of see how far it can go um, to make the piece, which is also part of the um, the restraint of, of the way you know I'm, I'm working. Rather than I could, I have made pieces before that have more than one afghan, but almost maybe only once. Mm -hmm. so, I have a question. So yeah, do you do you cut the afghan? That's a really great question too. I have only once cut an afghan apart and I made a piece with that, but what happens is because they're hand crocheted, they, they start falling apart. So I made that one piece, but that's about all I'll get from that afghan. So in answer to your question, I, I tend to use, I'm trying to remember if I, I think I may have started here I may have started here, um, and I I cover part of the afghan with the paint, press it down, then I I kind of mask this off so it won't get another layer. Not always. Sometimes I layer over and over, but in this case I did not. And then I change the color for here, and I'm I'm often in the same general area of the afghan. Not always. Um, but then, so then what also happens is you can see some of this color, or some of this color is here, some of this color is here, and, and so on, to, to, a, to a degree. It, it can vary, but I, I often work that way. Once the afghan is wet with paint, um, and, and over multiple times, the process of um, transferring the paint to the surface becomes easier. I don't know if that makes sense, but if you're a printmaker, it probably does. Does that answer your question? Yes. Someone else? How is it from the afghan? Is it? Yeah, they're all different sizes, but this afghan, so it was, it is at least as, as big as like that, because I don't see any breaks. Like sometimes I'll, you can see where maybe the afghan only made it to here and then I, uh, you know, I continue it. So the afghan in this case was a large one. But I work with small ones and then really large ones as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. Kinda? So um, the base color was the yellow or the black? It was the, the sort of, yeah, yellow gold. That was, that's the underpainting. 
Oh, the other page, you were yellow. Okay. Yes. And then the Afghan, you rolled back on it and transferred. Yes. Okay. Maybe could you speak a little bit? It could be the collaborative nature of what you're doing with people that you don't know. You didn't know the, the, you know, the people who made the, the work. Mm -hmm. And then you're, you're, you're you know, you, using the work in a really beautiful way. And I'm wondering what, if you feel some sort of connection or relationship to people that were from before you know, in this way. Yeah? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, definitely. Um, I sometimes I even get this eerie feeling that I know who they are. It's almost like a spiritual experience. Um, I, I definitely think there's um, collaboration um, because it wasn't just, you know, they made that Afghan, they, their hand made it. it. It probably, most of them have some kind of mistake in them. Um, right? And that's their mark. It's very specific. So I absolutely see it as a collaboration. I, there are times when I wish I definitely could name the person or knew the person or could have a conversation. Um, maybe, maybe at some point in the future I'll do a real collaboration between <laughs> someone who's made an Afghan um, and then use it. It, it, it seems like the work sort of continues on, though. It sort of has a legacy you know, a afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I mentioned that I have an incredible amount of uh, respect for those people that made these, uh, crocheted them. They took, I'm sure it took hours and hours. It's something I did not know how to do. Uh, so it's, it's their works of art in and of themselves. Voyage shows imperfections in the Afghan and stuff, and even though it's abstract, I think that does show your reverence kind of for the creator of the handmade things you know, that you're working with. Do you? I know this series is with Afghans, are all of your works like that, or do you get inspiration from handmade things or things like do you feel that from different things that you see? Like, does an inspiration just hit you from when you see something somebody else created like that? Or if you touch something somebody else created like that, do you feel that? Or do you, is it specifically these that struck you? Um, well, that's an interesting question, too. I mean, I am definitely drawn to the hand, things that are mm -hmm. handmade. I don't, I've only really used Afghans and, and Af the very beginning of this series uh, was actually um, I made I made a piece with a shag rug. That was the, the one and only time I've done that. And then I sort of found Afghans and began experimenting with them. But I don't use other pieces. I have I am drawn to sort of uh, dis the discarded, if that makes sense. So I've made sculpture. Um, if you go to my website, <laughs> you'll see uh, under the sculpture section, there are some pieces that are made with objects that I have found, and then I transform them into something something different. Yeah. That's very interesting. Thanks. Yeah. I think it's a So, have you used a press to produce any of your work, or do you just use them like wood blocks, I guess? No press, no wood block. I am. Um, I literally, it's, it's performance art, really. I am on top of the piece, um, you know, literally bending over. I use a little hand roller, a little brayer, to, um, with my hand, to kind of press it down, and then sometimes use my hand as well. Um, so yeah, that's, they're super, I'm sweating when I'm making them. <laughs> You know, it's not just your hand that's in the work, it's the hand of, of you know, whoever made the Afghan. But then there's also the chance process, like that's just part of a printmaking process mm -hmm. of kind of this blind, you know, you, you put something down and it comes, like what, you don't know what it's, what's going to come back up when you take up the, the Afghan or whatever, you're, you're, whatever material you're printing with. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another 
part of the, you know, you don't know what it's going to be, which is what you mentioned before, which is the yes, I think. Um, I mean, I think that's where the process of making the work sort of teaches me, gives back to me. Um, and, and that's, you know, kind of what keeps you going yeah. as an artist. Yeah. Well, that's a perfect ending, I think. We're about out of time for our, our lunchtime talk. But thank you, Caroline. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, everyone who made it to a, the grand finale of, of these artist talks. Um, this show will be up through April 30th. April 30th, I think, is a Sunday. It's the last day. Um, bring your friends, bring your family. Tell them to come see the show. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Thank you.